standing by. Good morning, good morning everybody. It's chilly today here on the live safari, the Greater Kruger National Park. We find ourselves within a small section on the western fringes called the Juma Private Game Reserve. Now, my name is James Hendry and I'm standing in a tree as a hornbill might be sitting in a tree perched waiting for the first rays of the sun to come up from the east and that's because it's only 11 degrees celsius 51 degrees fahrenheit which for us here in south africa is very cold many of you were wondering why it is that my plover like legs are exposed to the elements today and the answer is well there's so little flesh on them that they actually have no temperature function on my body at all on camera today, wrapped in seven jackets, four scarves, eight blankets and several beanie hats, Brian the Thumb Joubert. And his thumb is so cold this morning, he's unable to even bring it in front of the lens to show it to you. Yeah, we go. <laughs> anyway, in the final control, we've got Kirsten Max Smith being ably assisted by Jerry Cheesecake and, of course, Chelsea Green, all the way from the United States of America. You are most welcome. You are the most important part of what's going to happen for the next three hours. We're going to be going on a live safari. Uh, hopefully, our plan is to find Sindile. Now, I'm going to explain a bit more about him as we move. But because you are the most important part of the safari, we need to hear from you, please. Hashtag Safari Live. If you're on Twitter, it would be great to hear from you. You can email us as well, questions at wildearth.tv if you'd like to do that. Uh, either way will work, we'll get through to you, and, or you'll get through to us, and you can then ask us any questions or make any comments that you would like to. Please tell us where you're from when you get hold of us, because it's so nice to know where in the world we're talking to you from. I am now going to attempt to dis dismount from this tree uh, in an elegant fashion, unlike our friend Tingana, the dominant male leopard who basically falls out of trees, but he is a cat and lands on his feet absolutely fine. I will probably land on my nose and flatten it even further than it is already. Off to the western horizon, the sky is blackened. It's, well, it's kind of, it was black as I climbed up here, and it's so interesting to me always to watch how the night fades to the west as the day comes from the east. Of course, that's not unusual. It happens every day all over the world. Brian, if I fall from here, will you please put the camera into the sky and rush to my assistance? I'll film you. No, don't fool me falling. I will film you. Um, the other thing, everybody, is that we are one vehicle this morning, but not solo. Oh, no, on foot today and soon to be out is the great mystic farmer, Stefan Winterboer. He will be filmed by the diminutive but highly enthusiastic Viam Dorn Brach. This is the most dangerous bit. There we go. Look at my flexibility, Brian. It's incredible. Are you so amazed? <laughs> and the next most dangerous bit, of course, is avoiding this large Zizifus over here. And so I think I shall probably just leap elegantly from where I am now, hoping to avoid this. I think I'm going to get a strychnos in my bottom. <laughs> there we go. This is a strychnos, everybody. A strychnos madagascarensis. And, uh, well, it's got an interesting fruit that is quite nice, mixed with honey. But the seeds, of course, have strychnine in, you, in them, so not a good idea to eat that. And it's very noticeable venation. In other words, the veins of the leaves are distinctive. See, they come from the base and kind of go all the way around the top. Brian, I see that the little red light is on, which means you were recording my dismount there, weren't you? Just, Just in case you fell. Yes, for insurance purposes. Okay. Yes, well done. Thank you. Of course, one cannot feel anything when one has one's gloves on. I'm quite warm now, Brian, after that terrifying exertion. And I get 10 out of 10 for my dismount from the directors. Thank you very much, Max Smith. 
Right, so, Sandila, everybody, almost two years old, male leopard, went into rehab back at home. He was found, well, not found, his collar gave a reading yesterday from the Arethusa airstrip. Now, that's not too far from here. And so we are going to kind of drive around this area, which is Treehouse Dam. This is where he spent a lot of time. And then we're going to move towards Arethusa and see if we can't pick something up there. It would be so very nice to see him again. And for those of you who don't know why he was in rehab, he caught a domestic dog which had rabies and we were very scared that he would get rabies. So he was taken away, put in a rehabilitation center. When I say he went to rehab, I'm not joking. And he then was released about, what is it now, Brian, about two weeks ago? And he's been knocking about the Sabi Sands, which is where we are now. That's this collection of private reserves here on the western fringes of the Great Kruger National Park. And he hasn't been back into his mother's or father's territories until last night. And he's deep within his father's territory and his mother's territory. His mother is Shadow. Uh, we haven't seen her for a little while. And his father, Tingana, the dominant male leopard of this area. Well, we think that's his father. Most importantly, Tingana seems to think that he's his father. A lot of beeps from the Game Drive channel. Ah, it's because the volume is not on. All right, before I try and figure out what's going on the Game Drive channel, Sia van Winterboer is out and mobile, about to glisten in the morning sun. Let's go and get an update from him. What would a morning be without, or what would a morning bushwalk be without the obligatory spider that we open with, or at least of some sort that we find during the walk? This lonesome little spider we found camouflaged on this leaf, basically just waiting for the sun to come out so she can be warmed up and she can spin her web. She's a daytime orb spider of some kind, I'm not quite sure, but we've seen quite a lot of them on these Waltheria plants. I'm going to turn the leaf a little bit so that you can see exactly what her abdomen looks like. Look at those colors there, isn't that fantastic? As James mentioned, I'm Stefan Winterboer and on camera today, f making sure that your screen is filled with this arachnid is Wiem Dürnbach. Lovely morning here this morning in the Sabi Sands. Quite cold to be quite honest. It's probably around about 60 degrees Fahrenheit, about 10 degrees centigrade. Myself and Kirsty this morning had a shiver while we were having our coffee before we came out. But it looks like it's going to become quite a nice day. I'm quite looking forward to it today. Plan for this morning is we are going to go and have a look for the impala carcass, or what's left of it anyway, of uh, the hyenas. The hyenas apparently stole an impala carcass and moved across Philemon's dip, and we're going to go and see if we can track that out today. But we got sidetracked as always by something, and this young missus. We've seen quite a few of them, as I mentioned in the opening here, in that she will wait until the sun is shining and then she will spin herself an orb web. And she looks quite in. We're seeing a few of these. I'm not I'm still not sure what orb this is. I have got a new spider book, but it is singularly possibly the most complex key I've ever had to use in my life. And keying out these spiders are proving a task that is above and beyond my skills at the moment. But nevertheless, we will carry on. And I think a good idea is to walk. Oh, we've got impalas charging us. Who knows what that was from? Yeah. They've just run past us on the open area. Impalas, of course, spend a lot of their time on open areas during the evenings. These big open plains that we have, like we're close to quarantine, are the perfect refuges for them at night time. It makes it very difficult for predators to sneak up on impala on these open areas. And then during 
the, the morning, usually they move to the outskirts of these open areas and depending on where the food is, they will move further and deeper into the thicker bush areas, coming back again at night time into these open areas. They're quite good indicators of water impala. In dry times like this now, impala are very rarely further away than about one mile from a water, from a water source. And it's for that reason that the Kruger National Park decided that they would close certain of their water points. I heard a fact the other day that there were over 300 of these water points that the Kruger National Park closed. Um, and this is in an effort to reduce impala numbers. Impalas are sort of like um, the bush equivalent of a goat that we have out here. And when times are really dry and when animals need to basically are, are, are living on their limits, impala quite often will shift from a grass-based diet to a plant-based based diet and almost like goats sort of denude an area of, of plants and, and, and the Kruger Park thinks that the overabundance of, of, of impala that we have at the moment, roughly 250,000 impala plus, are due to there being so much surface water around. They close some of the pans, the hope is that during a drought like this impala numbers would decrease and overall the bush would be healthier. Their mandate of course is to protect all biodiversity, that's what the Kruger National Park needs to do and they've earmarked impala among certain other species uh, as problem animals. Not, not problem animals in terms of exotics or problem animals in terms of something that's causing a massive problem but definitely something in their scientific studies that they need to keep an eye on. Right, so we are going to be making our way into that bush that you see, heading for those trees that you can see there in the distance. Those tall trees is where we earring or earmarking to go. And uh, while we're getting there, I'm going to send you through to James for an update. Right here, everybody, nothing to report just yet. Um, we're just pressing our way slowly towards the west to where he was seen well on his collar he was seen yesterday so that's where we're going to be going now and um, there was something else of vital importance I needed to tell you oh yes now we've been talking quite a lot about the hyena den and where they are and the hyena den it would seem everyone has moved to Simbambili now Simbambili is to the north and to the west of us which means that we can't go there but there were many, many tracks going in that way, many drag marks of things that have been pilfered by the hyenas. And Herbert walked that area flat yesterday, just seeing what was going, to, going on there. And he is convinced that the hyena den has gone onto Simbambili. So unfortunately, our very special hyenas, I'm sure they will come back at some stage, have moved onto Simbambili for the foreseeable future. So that's very sad news, I'm afraid. Righty, we're now on the southern boundary, and with any luck, this is exactly where Sandila used to sort of have his ha hunting grounds, where his mother used to leave him when she'd go on her extended hunting forays. I'll show you the very termite mound that he used to be found on. It would be so very very great to see him again but of course he has no experience of us for the last six months so I'm not sure I don't think any game drivers have seen him actually I'm not sure how many have actively tried to track him but with any luck we will be the first as we were his first friends weren't we Brian Weird. yes the Sun you can see has just come up you can see it's catch caught the top of the trees Now, Ellen, a very good question from you. I don't know the answer to it, but I'm going to guess. You say if he was to come across Tingana, the dominant male leopard of the area, most likely his father, would there be some form of recognition, A, and B, how would that recognition take place? I don't know if, if there would be recognition. I think his absence from the area certainly has been noted, uh, not consciously, but noted subconsciously by his mother who came into Eastress again and has since given birth to a little sibling, to Sindile. But would his father recognize him by smell? 
if they were to recognize each other, that's how it would happen. It would be some kind of familial smell. Well, whether that will happen or not, I couldn't tell you. But with any luck, we'll be able to find out fairly soon. And then, nice question from you, of course, and I think it's the question forefront and then to everyone's minds. Would Sandila hurt Shadow's cub? I don't know. I don't think so. We know that I've, there are many, many examples of older siblings, especially male siblings, sort of not necessarily having friendly interactions with the cubs of their mothers, but certainly having interactions with them that were not harmful. There's the termite mount he used to sit on. used to sit on top of that and gaze imperiously into the distance. And I think the first time we saw him on there, he had caught a little mongoose, which he didn't want to eat. He just sort of flapped it about a bit. Not sure why. And that's where he lived. He's not there now. Of course, he will be probably unrecognizable because he'll be, of course, well, eight months larger than he was back then. So, who knows? Otherwise, pretty quiet out here. Not much in the way of animals. We saw a couple of impala on the way out. Now, Annie, you're in British Columbia and you've been watching for a while and you know that we've been collecting scat samples for the Panthera NGO who are doing research into the leopards here and apparently they're doing some form of DNA testing on the scats and that will in turn eventually give us an idea exactly of the paternity of the animals that we're seeing here. Um, you want to know if we, get, we have the results? No, we don't. And B, if we will ever get the results? I don't know. Um, I assume, I'm, I think we will, I hope we will, but um, I'm not sure, you know, how long it takes or, or what the story is there. We've had some comeback from that, but nothing in the way of DNA analysis has come out of it yet. And nothing explosively amazing has come out of it either yet. Yet. It may well still. I've just found our first animal. Can you believe it, Brian? My skills are so exceptional that I found our first animal. Let me retrieve him for you. I have to take the blankie off my leggies. There he is, Brian. Amazing. A millipede. Now this millipede, everybody, I have put on the dashboard because I don't wish to hold him because sometimes they can relieve themselves in fear. And the smell of a millipede's dung, for want of a better term, is disgusting. But look at his amazing colors, maroon and black, indicating the presence of toxins. And that toxin in this case is cyanide, which we know, of course, is not very good for you, or any most other animals. And there, those little things sort of protruding from the scales, of course, are his legs. Each, each of those scales, or each of those segments, has got a pair of jointed legs. Now, I know that when people talk about animals, mostly they're referring to the mammals. We don't even think of birds as being animals, but of course this is as much an animal as an impala or indeed Sindila, who we hope to find. Many, 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 many more invertebrates than there are vertebrates. Vertebrates, of course, being animals with an internal skeleton. This is an invertebrate with an external skeleton that is very hard. So the rigidity of his body comes entirely from the exoskeleton. All right, come over here. I'll get off the road. It's a very dangerous place to be. There we are. He'll be okay, Brian.
Michelin man this morning. Yes, well, not nothing like you, of course. All right, let's get an update from Steph. We're going to head into Arethusa and get an update from them. Now you come to us in this thicket, and it's quite an interesting little thicket. Immediately, what, uh, what is apparent is that there's quite a lot of activity going on over here from a feeding activity. And something that was noticed as we walked in here are these, what seem like, balls of seeds of some sort and upon closer inspection are actually part of a plant that we called call a poison apple. It's part of the Solanum family which is the same family of plants that potatoes belong to and funny enough these little fruits uh, when they are when they are new they have got a green skin and are actually quite poisonous it's something that you don't want to eat but in this particular form they dried up and in actual fact, you can see that they've been cracked open and eaten by something. I don't quite know if it's an animal that's eaten it or it is an insect. I would hazard to say it's probably an insect. Have a look at that. That's definitely been eaten into and then hollowed out, leaving this quite hard shell. There we go. Managed to. I had my spinach this morning using the immense strength of my two fingers to crack that open. <laughs> Not much in it. So no remnants of what it was that ate it. It was obviously something that came in, ate and then left again or came in, pupated and left again. But nevertheless these are poison apples in Afrikaans we call them gif apokis which means exactly the same thing. Gif is poison or poison apples. Solanum family. And then what else is quite apparent is there's this lovely smell in this glade also a potato smell and that is coming from this plant. This here is the potato bush and this is the potato bush's flowers. You can see there the tiny little flowers that don't actually get any bigger than, than this and they have the most beautiful potato chippy smell. So if I were to describe it to you it would be just before you deep fry some potato chips it would be that that sort of greenish potato smell and they flower in autumn through our winter and it basically imbibe the bush around us with this most wonderful smell. Something that I never pass up the favor of smelling. Oh, it smells good. It just reminds me of, it just makes me hungry basically by the way, but like a really potato smell. And that gives it its name, the potato bush. I actually don't think that Viem has smelt this at all. So I'm going to show you one more time what it looks like there. Those, funnily enough, are its flowers. Now on that note, and while VM sticks his nose into this, James has got the sun peeping up over the horizon, which we can't see at all. So you'll have to see James in the sunrise, and we'll catch up with you in a little bit. The sun we have, everybody, and we just wanted to show you the dust dropping down through the trees there, caught, catching the rays of the sun. I think it's very pretty, don't you, Brian? I do. It looks almost otherworldly. Mm. It would be very nice to see a leopard emerging from beneath it. But I'm not sure that will happen. I had to take a picture of that, everybody. Of course, must be done. Okay, we're here at the sort of entrance to Simbam, not Simbambili, to Arathusa. And so we're going to go down this way, uh, along the driveway. He also used to be found around here. And one wonders if he isn't coming towards his old hunting grounds. And if you've just joined us and wondering who he is, he is a Sindile the two-year-old male leopard who was recently returned to the Sabi Sands after his stint in her rehabilitation center. And his collar, he's wearing a, a tracking collar, it in indicated his position around this area yesterday evening. So with any luck, we may bump into him. Let's try and get some form of update on the radio here. Uh, 
and then we'll be able to tell. Uh huh. Doesn't seem to be particularly effective. Rami in Ohio, apparently it was said that when he was released that his collar would eventually fall off and you want to know what will happen then. Well, I mean, I, I, guess, I guess he will have to be tracked in the traditional way, which is basically what we're going to do. We don't have access to exactly where he is all the time. We just get an update once every few days. So, I mean, it's not like I can go and find him on the back end of some telemetry on his collar. But, um, Rami, when it falls off, that's absolutely fine. It's completely normal. And, you know, I think the idea... I think the idea is that it will fall off uh, after, say, six months or so when he's kind of established himself or demonstrated that he's able to look after himself. What is that on the road, Brian? Is that just a... It's a bush, Brian. Yet another magnificent looking bush, yes, that thing sticking out into the road, I thought maybe it would be something interesting. Now I can hear something going on in Arethusa, I'm just going to try and hear what it is. Remember we also had the two Matimba males yesterday on, oh and there's some elephants very cross in here. hear them shouting just inside here very thick bush there they are is that them no that's just trees just let's have a listen isn't that a terrifying sound going on there. I just before we bump into a sighting, I'm just going to get a quick update on the radio, everybody. Morning stations, Arethusa. Any update for Arethusa this morning? Um, not copying properly. Thanks very much. I'll get a bit closer and call again. All right. So it doesn't it doesn't look like we're going to bump into anything at the moment. We'll just drive carefully. our way on here. It does sound like there's something going on here. It might just be those elephants, but it might also be that those elephants are shouting at the two Matimba males. Uh, they will shout at predators like that. Clearly there have been some elephants here. They have pushed this tree over, much the same as they pushed the tree that I climbed earlier over. Right, quickly, let's go across to Steph. I'll try and figure out what's going on here and we'll catch up with you after a butterfly. I have no idea what butterfly this is. I'm sure Brent would have an idea. But what it is, it's strikingly beautiful. And she or he is on this grass because it's obviously cold. They are cold-blooded and they need 
the warmth of the sun to warm the fluid in their wings, which then gets pumped into their bodies. And then from there, they build up enough heat to fly around during the middle of the day. But have a look at these. I mean, why this butterfly would be white with black spots on it is beyond me. Most animals would choose in periods of dormancy to remain unseen. But this particular butterfly has chosen exactly the opposite. It has chosen to be very conspicuous and spent the entire evening here last night actually on this grass stem. Now one thing that I have seen immediately is that directly below is another butterfly, although probably about half the size. Have a look at this view. I mean, that's my four finger that you can see there, and that butterfly is also sitting with its wings angled towards the sun, waiting for the morning light. I can't even see the detail on this particular butterfly. I just know that it is camouflaged and brown and lying directly below this beautiful black and white butterfly. Not related. Butterflies tend to be about the same size as one another, male and female. Dimorphism in the sexes can be quite extreme. You can get females looking one way and you can get males looking another. And then in the other instances, like the monarch butterflies, you, you can get butterflies that look identical. Male and female are identical to one another. But now, while I've had my face up at these grasses, I've got another lesson to show you in actual fact. You know, just get these grasses out the way because they aren't going to hurt my lesson. This is a grass, I'm going to lift it up. This is what the grass looked like when it was an adult, with the seeds there. Now, grass seeds are definitely very precious to grasses. And they've got one of the most amazing ways of protecting their seeds from ants, <clears throat> which of course collect seeds. Have a look at that. That is a grass's defense mechanism for protecting its seeds. Ants would come from the stalk, and they would encounter at every node this barrier of spikes which would basically stop most ants from crawling up the stem and collecting the grass seeds and then easily walking back down the stem again. This is one of those things that stop that. So that is this grass's protection measure against ants. Isn't that amazing? And at every single node there are some more. There's some there. I just find that incredible. Now, generally speaking, grasses that grow in areas like we are at the moment <clears throat> need those types of protections. And the reason for that is that these particular areas where we are are quite wet. We're quite close to that drainage line. We just smelt the potato bush in. And coming up from the drainage line, we'll, we'd get to these marshy, soggy places. And that's what we're in at the moment. Indicated by this wolf area, that's definitely an indicator plant of a soggy area. When we see that, especially in summer months when it's been very warm, when you were in cars, one of the things that we look out for is this. So Brent and James and Jamie would be looking out for this species of plant when they're driving around in deep summer because it means that there's a very good chance of getting stuck in these particular areas. But now, while I... I was just busy listening over there while, while we were busy having a chat, and there's a woodpecker that's busy bashing his face against one of the stumps here. We're going to look for that. And James has finally found those elephant. Well, everybody, we found the elephants that were making the noise. There's a herd of elephants in here. And I'm just listening carefully to the radio as well. Now, what they were shouting at, we figured out from a smell in the air. And the smell in the air, of course, was that that elephant bull that you've just seen disappear into the bush is in heavy must. He's left powerful, powerful scent of his dripping urine. And it smells like kind of sweet, leathery, sweet, leathery smell. And he's clearly been harassing the ladies of the herd. And they've been shouting at him. He's definitely interested in a little bit of well, oh, amorous morning intentions is what he's after. 
and clearly they're not after the same thing and that's why they were shouting at him very loudly. Now, update from here is that uh, no Sindila so far and those Matimba males have left their kill. It's now being devoured by hyenas. The kill itself is in a position, oh in fact in this car we might be able to get in there so we'll go and have a look-see. But in the meantime, let's carry on going forward and we'll just see if we don't pick up tracks of a young male leopard. if we can't get a better view of those elephants. I know that for many of you, you'll be asking the question as to why we're not driving off road for them. Uh, for the duration of the drought, we're not going to go off the road for elephants because, well, in, in, most of the time they have relatively common sightings. Okay, of course, we do have weeks without them sometimes. But at the moment, especially with the Sabi sands basically being a huge sink for uh, animals uh, in the drought because of the water that there is uh, elephants should be relatively easy to come by and so we won't be doing a huge amount of off-road driving for them until the next rains come along. Let's drive down here and see if we don't get sight of further elephants. can't see anything there. So we were driving along as you left us last and <laughs> suddenly the air was filled with this amazing smell and it really is so distinctive. Brian picked it up first and it's the most, you can't mistake it for anything else once you've smelt it, it's the smell of a mustable elephant and I'm sure that's what they were very cross with. fighting with all these radios that we have here. Just easing gently down here. Now we're coming into the kind of thick bush where a leopard might like to lurk, especially if he was a bit nervous. Sandila, of course, will be quite nervous about life at the moment. He's, well, he's now in a relatively familiar area but, you know, he's, um, he, he hasn't established himself. It's a bit like when you, I guess, a, 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 you move to a new area or as a youngster you move to a new school. You have to establish yourself in the already established hierarchy. You have to feel things out. Who's a threat? Who isn't a threat? And that's what he's doing now. So it doesn't surprise me that he hasn't been viewed by game drives. Let's just move down here and then we're going to move back towards Arethusa Lodge. We'll pop past where the kill was and then we'll make our way back around in a loop to the south. Maybe we'll be lucky. Maybe we won't. Sarah, you want to know how often Sandila's collar reports? Well, I think it probably reports to the uh, Sabi stands on a daily basis. I don't know exactly where he is all the time, but we don't get those reports all the time. We only get them, I think, once every two or three days. So we know that he was initially released in the northern Sabi sands. He went straight into Mala Mala from there. What have you got, Brian? Oh, you mean that big grey thing there? There's an elephant. That's quite nice. Um, yeah, so, and then he was, so he went straight into Mala Mala, and then he wandered across to Londolozi, spent a bit of time there, and has now come back up here to where he was born. Whether he knows he was born here or not, who knows? One can but speculate. That just amazes me how well hidden these animals can stay and how silently they move. 
That one's not very silent, is it, Brian? Making quite a crushing noise. Looks like a young bull. Not being very confiding, are they, Brian? Let's go forward. I think there are a few more in front of us. I can hear them moving about there. Now, more and more, of course, as the dry season progresses, this kind of riverine vegetation, so the thick stuff that goes on the river banks or the dry drainage line banks, are going to become habitat for elephants because they'll be looking for trees to eat. The grass is basically finished already, and it's quite early in the year for the grass to be finished. There's another elephant. It's going to be relatively quiet in here, of course. We are hemmed in on both sides by many trees. Now Joey, you're in Australia and a good question from you as we sit here with just a couple of elephants in this thick bush. You say, what is the largest elephant herd that I've ever seen? Probably about a hundred individuals. That's pretty big for the Kruger area. Uh, you do hear, herds of, hear of herds of 500 or so in Botswana, going to and from the Chobe River, for example, during the dry season. But you don't generally get herds that size in this area, or very, very, very seldom. And I mean, a hundred in this area is, is really big. They really don't want to be on camera this morning. Oh, there's a little one in there. Let's just get around the corner and assess how many we have and what we're looking at here. So what you don't want to do in an area like this is get in amongst the herd where they get nervous because they can't see properly because of the, all the trees. And the same for us. There's a nice gap here in the trees. And these elephants are quite close, which is great. There we go. I'm sorry, I don't know why the car is making this creaking, groaning noise. Now watch carefully how they move aside the thorny bushes to pick exactly the shoot that they want. That looks like a rather dejected Scotia tree or boa bean. And this is a young bull, and behind the young bull, I think it's a young bull, yes, it is a young bull. Behind the young bull, another youngster. So the herd must be more extensive than just these two. <laughs> oh dear. I suddenly had a, um, a, a great need to breathe in deeply. <laughs> I'm not sure where that came from. <laughs> Ooh. Hmm. Oh, he's so, better now. Something in the air. I'm feeling very good now, yes. Yeah. Excellent. Anyway, the extent of the herd is, is larger than this. And I know that, of course, because there is a very little one just behind this young bull. And in the background, you can hear black-headed oriole. Oh, look at the toes. Very nice, Brian. Those are toenails, everyone. Now, they don't normally last very long on an elephant's foot. They eventually kind of fall out in the same way that if you run a marathon or hike a lot, you can use your toes. So that happens here. Not your toes, lose your toenails, I mean. That's really cool. I'd love to find one of those in the bush. I've never seen one. I wonder if he'd give it to us. Mm. That's on the front foot, and they're normally five on the front foot when the elephant's born and four on the back. And normally, they only maintain the very front one on the back, and often on the front, nothing.
Now, a question about whether I'm ever nervous around must bull elephants. Uh, the answer is yes, sometimes. The one that we saw there, oh, look at this, this is wonderful. The, the must bull we saw there was, um, was quite young. So he didn't kind of terrify me too much, and he show, he was showed no interest in us whatsoever, so that didn't worry me. I'm not going to move the car. We're quite close to this chap. Might actually be a young cow. Just try and see between her front legs, or his front legs. That'll confirm it to us. Only sitting, standing now about, oh, what did we say, about 10 meters from us. It's a young cow, everyone, it's not a young bull. And that makes sense then, because that's why that other young elephant is around her. I'm not always that easy to tell, and I find myself particularly bad at telling. But now that you know this is a cow, you can point out the fact she's got quite a square forehead, quite thin, pointy tusks, and of course quite a flat back. She didn't like her tusks being described as thin and pointy, did she, Brian? Yeah, she's now very cross with us. Oh well. Yeah, they're all through this thicket, everyone. And there will be, you'll find that if we don't get water, these thickets are going to be denuded of trees. They can look a little bit sort of devastated after a dry season, but it's completely normal. And every tree that they push over, remember, forms habitat for any number of other animals. Oh, the usual story, Brian. Please observe, everybody. Every time we watch an animal for any length of time, it must eventually go to the loo. And this young elephant is no exception. Well done. Some lovely bird calls around us here. We've got a what used to be called a fan-tailed flycatcher going plee, plee, plee. Kitra, you're in India and it's lovely to hear from you all the way from India. I hope you're having a, well, I guess it must be fairly late morning there now. I hope it's a good late morning for you. Uh, you want to know if they return to the same breeding grounds every year. No, they don't, Kitra. They breed anywhere, pretty much. There's no need for them to come back to the same place at all. They will be within their home range, and I don't think they have any preference for where they give birth or where they mate. All righty, let's move on. Very nice little elephant sighting there. Confiding cow until I told her she had pointy straight tusks. She didn't like that at all. Decided it was very insulting and off she went. So I don't think anybody's found tracks of this young male leopard. Anyway, we may or may not be lucky. Let's go across to Steph to get an update from him. I'm going to pop around to the Arethusa waterhole. <laughs> so, v, I'm busy showing you that there's some, there, are, there is some life around us at the moment. We just got to find whatever deposited that dung. Viam, have a look here quickly. Sorry, folks, it's going to be a bit jarring. But what we've got is we've got two eagles flying in the distance and a roller that's busy escorting. I don't know what eagles they were. They flew over a little bit quick. It was just literally while I was trying. Here goes a the roller there. You got him rolling. Oh, just missed him. Here goes again. Oh. Sometimes so difficult to see what we're seeing through the aperture of the lens and it's just what happened there was there were two eagles that took off and a roller was busy dive bombing these two eagles as they were trying to get to a thermal 
And obviously for eagles, they're big heavy birds. They need to flap their wings, get to a thermal, and the lighter roller had the height advantage and was using it to dive bomb those two birds. Pity we couldn't show you, but that was what was happening. But back to what we were saying, is that um, you got VM having a look at some fresh dung when you crossed over to us, and that is from a zebra. There are some zebras around here, we haven't seen any, but that literally is from this morning. And you caught me looking at this wonderful home that this spider has built inside this grass. And I couldn't quite see what, I couldn't quite see what, uh, what spider it is. But what you can definitely see is the fact that this spider has taken this grass seed and using goodness knows what strength, folded the grass inflorescence into itself and then stuck it, stuck it together with, with web. And this spider is actually in there. I'll show you with this other grass where she's sitting. Right there. All right, now I've just been asked a question. I have got a sketchy comms at the moment, but I did get the fact that there's some question asked about what happened, what would happen if spiders had to cease to exist? What would, what would happen? I think, to be honest, I think we'd probably be inundated with pests. Spiders play a vital role in controlling of insects. That is their primary function, is they control insects and insect pests. And there are literally thousands upon thousands of different types of spiders. Literally thousands of each member of, of, of species of spider represented here in the bush. And they, they have a huge impact. I mean, it would be quite interesting to see if somebody's worked out exactly what the tonnage of insects are that spiders consume per year or per season, perhaps even per day. But it's got to be something astronomical. I think spiders are... Not only are they wonderful things, but I think that they play a wonderful role in limiting insect pests for us, or insects that could become pests. Flies, for instance, um, grasshoppers, most of these animals are controlled by, by spiders. Locusts and crickets, whatever, I could, I'm just busy thinking. Ah. The Leopold just asked me an interesting question. Do I have more respect for spiders that hunt or spiders that sit in webs? Leopold, that's a good question. Um, and I'm going to say that I probably respect them equally. Spiders that sit in webs fascinate me because of their manipulation of silk. Um, talking about that, I've got enough silk covering my eyes to weld them shut at the moment. But spiders that manipulate silk and build these fantastically shaped webs fascinate me because I don't understand how they do it. I understand how their bodies produce the silk, but how do they decide what silk goes where in this massively complex web? How do they do that with a brain that doesn't even exist? They just got this collection of nerves, basically. And then spiders that hunt fascinate me equally as much because of the ability to catch specific animals. Now, each prey species is influenced by a whole set of dynamics. It's influenced about where food is and where its home is and what the orientation of the sun is. And these little predators can actually predict what's going to happen and catch the specific prey. They're almost like they're key to it. And then you get other spiders like jumping spiders which hunt spiders. And um, once again you've got two predators that are that are keyed to different things that are basically you know, they, they, one outcompetes the other. Just for me, it's fascinating. So to answer your question, there, it's a little bit of both. I have respect for both, but for for different reasons. Um, I hope that answered your question, there, Leopold. Nice, nice question. I like questions that end up in a bit of discussion. Now, just to come back to VM's dung pile. <clears throat> this is not the same one that you were having a look at. This is this is a different one, but also from zebra. A zebra are similar to rhino and to a certain degree elephant and warthog, hind gut fermenters. And you can see there that very fibrousy piece of grass is not chewed particularly well. 
There are a lot of grasses that are fine here, but generally that's quite a fibrous head dung. And you can have a look at the amount of it as well. So dung that's not chewed, or grass that's not chewed very well, plus a large volume of dung makes you think that this animal needs to eat a lot to keep going. And that's exactly what zebra do, is that they can utilize lots of very hardcore grasses that other animals can't. But to get enough nutrition to feed themselves, they've got to eat lots of it. Handgut fermenting, something that really stands animals with that particular type of digestion well in winter time. All right. And on that note, and on to a much more bitter topic, James is standing by with something interesting for you. Okay, there's a little bee eater, everybody. We've just stopped here to have a quick look at him sitting in the sun, but it seems we're right close to that buffalo carcass. It seems that there are lions moving in there. I can't hear exactly on the radio. Let's just move there. We're not far away, and I don't know which lions they are. I don't think they're the same two males. It's not too far from where we are now. Let's go and have a look. Just down in the drainage line here. Not sure. I've just heard on the radio that something's moving there. They said we can move in. So let's pop down there and have a squeeze, Brian. What do you say? Just in the drainage here. A little difficult to get in there, so there'll be some scraping and thumping, but we can do it. I think it was down here, wasn't it? Brian, yes, it was. <coughs> oh no, it's actually this way. trying to listen to the radio everybody so if I do look like I'm A distracted and B ignoring you, I promise I'm not. Oh there we go. It's a tailless female. Let's go in, well maybe we're going this way, hang on. I can see one lioness there. We may well try and make our way around the other side, but we'll be able to get a view from in here. There's a whole pride, there's a whole pride of lions coming in here. Yeah, it's the tail this line is the Salala pride. Lionesses. So not the best view everyone, but not bad. Look how pale she is. That's really interesting. And there's the third one coming, young male. How cool is this? This was totally unexpected. Brian and I expected to find a couple of hyenas here. So there you can see they're a little bit nervous. All right, uh, okay, you man, yeah. Okay, everybody, we're gonna have to go back a little bit. These guys can't see properly. Hold on one sec.
Sorry about this, everybody. Perhaps something has pushed over the Gauri repeater, just like the elephants have pushed over this marula tree. Our technical team is rushing around, madly trying to fix it, and we'll be back with you as soon as we can. Sorry about this, everybody. Perhaps something has pushed over the Gauri repeater, just like the elephants have pushed over this marula tree. Our technical team is rushing around, madly trying to fix it, and we'll be back with you as soon as we can. Sorry about this, everybody. Perhaps something has pushed over the Gauri repeater, just like the elephants have pushed over this marula tree. Our technical team is rushing around, madly trying to fix it, and we'll be back with you as soon as we can. Sorry about this, everybody. Perhaps something has pushed over the Gauri repeater, just like the elephants have pushed over this marula tree. Our technical team is rushing around, madly trying to fix it, and we'll be back with you as soon as we can. Sorry about this, everybody. Perhaps something has pushed over the Gauri repeater, just like the elephants have pushed over this marula tree. Our technical team is rushing around, madly trying to fix it, and we'll be back with you as soon as we can.
sorry about this, everybody. Perhaps something has pushed over the Gauri repeater, just like the elephants have pushed over this marula tree. Our technical team is rushing around madly trying to fix it, and we'll be back with you as soon as we can. Okay, everybody, I think we've got a little bit of picture now. So there we are. Well, it's a really good picture from where I'm sitting. Three lionesses, or sorry, two lionesses, one young male, feeding on this buffalo carcass. I'm not sure how much you heard last time we were live with them. Very lucky to have come in here and seen them. It's the two Salala lionesses and a young male from the same pride. They're seemingly out of territory and not basically where they should be. Oh, they don't really have an established territory and they're kind of in the Styx Pride Territory and the Nkuhuma Pride Territory. And so they're looking a little bit nervous. And look at that one there. Look how amber her eyes are like our friend from the Nkuhuma Pride. She's very pale though, and so easily identifiable. And the hyenas apparently had a go at this carcass this morning, but they have since absconded in the face, I think, of these, possibly of these lions. Very nice, indeed, to have an experience like this. Um, I'm afraid my signal with the final control is so poor that for you to be able to send through a question here is going to be almost impossible. But you can try. In fact, what I'll do is I'll turn my phone on and then Kirsten can just WhatsApp any questions you might have. That's going to be the best option, I think. I'll just find out if I've got some signal here. Yeah, Kirsty, I've got signal, so just WhatsApp through a question if there is one. Otherwise, let's just enjoy. Wonderful, Brian. Wonderful. Not a bad way mm -hmm. to enjoy our day. There we go. <laughs> There's the first one. Kirst, it's pointless talking to me, I'm afraid. I cannot hear what you're saying, but you can send WhatsApp. I will get those. Amazing, this. And look at the colors. I mean, I know it's a bit grim looking at the colors and appreciating the red death almost but still wonderful to see them feeding. And I just love this winter ve vegetation with the it's deep green in the, veg in the drainage line areas, but away from it, gold. And of course now juxtaposed with the red of the blood. did drive through a bit of mud on the way here, everyone. Uh, Brian, are you covered in mud? No, thankfully. I am covered in mud. I'm sorry, James. Well, thank you for your sympathy and care. I do appreciate it. It's noted. Right, I think we have a question coming through. Ah, oh, yes, Kirsten McLennan-Smith sent me a message. Question. Agri girl. No, a girl girl. A girl girl. Someone called a girl girl says, how hard is it to be a tailless lion? Well, I don't have personal experience, of course, of being a tailless lion, a girl girl. But interestingly, this lioness's mother, I used to know when I was a few years younger than I am now, and her mother didn't have a tail either. Uh, it's not genetic. It's just coincidence that they've both sort of been eaten off by parasites and so uh, it's not difficult at all they survive absolutely fine and yeah I, I mean it might make a slight difference to their ability to communicate with their cubs as youngsters or with each other but I really don't think that it affects their lives a great deal at all wonderful wonderful sighting this it really is the light is perfect 
and I believe the bushwalk has gone down, I'm afraid, so you're with us alone at the moment. Oh, my signal's getting a bit dodgy. Let me put my phone... Oh, no service now, so not sure we'll be getting any more questions. <laughs> anyway, I'm just going to quickly talk on the game drive radio. Because I know that there will be people trying to get into the sighting. So just excuse me one sec. No, in fact, I think we're okay. So these lines is apparently to chase off the hyenas. Stations, if you are looking to get into this line sighting, um, I've got very poor comms unless you're very close by. So I will move out if there are people on standby to come in here. Just let me know when you're really close. What a joy. We've been so lucky with cats recently, me especially. I don't think I've had a cat-free drive for the last little while. Which must be considered something of a bonus, I imagine. No, 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 we've got no service on the cell phones either, I'm afraid, everyone. So, no questions, just enjoy the view. <laughs> <laughs> now, Brian, if you have any questions, of course, feel free to ask them, or indeed some comments. Okay. If you could just do them in a different accent or something like that, so that I could enjoy them. John in Missouri, perhaps. Mm. I just love her amber eyes. She really does have very amber eyes. And we've got ourselves into the most perfect position here. Gorgeous kind of light filtering through the trees. We've got full view from the front. A little bit grim, of course, especially if you happen to be the buffalo. But not too bad. Now, let's just try and assess what happened here. Or let me just back up a bit and give you an idea of what happened here. The two timber males <coughs> are basically males without territory at the moment. So they don't really have a fixed place where they're able to live. And that means that they will wander about the place. I think they were feeling a bit of pressure from the... Um, from the Majingalan coalition. And the Majingalan coalition seems to have come back into the area where they were around Londolozi, so they came up north to their own. <coughs> there we go. That's why lions have constantly got injuries on them. So the Majingal the Matimbas killed these lions, kill killed this buffalo, I think. And then they ate it only for the extent probably of, you know, they ate a little bit last night, at least yesterday morning, and then they disappeared yesterday afternoon, and then they came back and had a bit of a bite to eat last night, and then they left. We don't know why they left. I think it's simply because they're nervous. They don't want to be in one place at any one time. They're in very good condition, though. And then the hyenas came, and they couldn't believe their luck, they ate a whole lot of this. It wouldn't have been from our clan of hyenas. It would have probably been from the Arethusa <coughs> slash uh, Elephant Plains clan of hyenas. Very big clan. And then these three lionesses came in and chased off, or two lionesses and one young male, chased off the hyenas. They'll have melted off into the bushes around here somewhere. And you can see that they're looking pretty nervous. They're not eating with complete comfort.
especially the older one, the tailless lioness. She's looking around, keeping an eye out. And in the background, you can maybe hear the elephants calling. Anyway, we're going to sit here for a little while. We've probably got another five or so minutes here before we'll have to move out for some of the other vehicles. And then we'll maybe get more com communications with the final control. But at the moment, I'm afraid, I can hear nothing they say, and the phones are not working. So hopefully we still have signal with you. It might not be live, Brian. Mm. Would be a pity not to share this, wouldn't it? Indeed. A travesty. A travesty of epic proportions. Ah, I got a little bit from Kirsten there saying that we are live. Get that, Brian. Mm. That's a, a question from Alex in Dallas. Alex, I've got absolutely no idea what you want to know. I'm afraid. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, she seems to have found a bit of rotting bit there. How delightful, Brian. Mm. Very delightful indeed. going to get an idea now from the game drives as to who's coming in. See how she keeps looking up and around. Definitely a little bit nervous. Settling into it now as nothing has happened over the while they've been here. Uh, bit grim. I mean, the smell, of course, is pretty bad. She's got very amber eyes. Totally unaffected by the vehicles, of course. Go ahead. I am, I can move out if there's no space. Um, there's probably space here on the southern side as well. Very good view. Copy, when the next station wants to move in, please let me know, I'll move out. really is perfect. Anyway, don't know what these chaps are going to do. This is not the whole Solala Pride. I think there are a few more of them. There were certainly three young males at one stage. Where they've disappeared off to, I'm not really sure. Yeah, they, both, they all look a bit nervous. Okay, everyone, we've got about a minute left and then we're going to have to pull out to make space for other vehicles. But we were very lucky. She's giving you the hairy eyeball there, Brian. Mm -hmm. It's an elephant. There's a huge elephant coming in here. That's what they're looking at. Big elephant bull. He's off to the, exactly where that lion's looking. But behind a big termite mound, you won't be able to see him. There he comes, Brian. 
You see him there. You just see his grey coat or his grey his gray skin sort of shining through the bush there. There he's smelling. He can smell carcass now. He'll smell lions. And he won't like the smell of carcass or lions. Yeah, I'm sure he's just, I don't know that he's coming to investigate. I think he's just walking on through. There are two other vehicles behind there where the elephant is going. He's just giving a little head shake. You may have heard that. As he shook his head. He'll be smelling them now. I can hear something coming through here from Final Control about the possibility of there being a vultures in the area. Yes, we did see one vulture. I don't know who the question is from, so I'm sorry about that. There was a vulture as we drove in. But it seems to have moved off. Oh, there's the elephant. You can just see it moving back there. Let's see what happens. Coming towards the lions. Here it comes. Here it comes. How oh, brilliant is this? This is unbelievable. This is amazing. Now what we don't want is to get in the way of the elephant, of course, because he's irritated. But we're certainly not in his way now. because lions are always hungry, of course. No, he's not happy. He's coming back towards them. also have to vacate fairly soon in order to avoid the attentions of this elephant but he did go past the other two vehicles and had no problem oh. he's very angry my heart is pounding and just the older lioness, the one without the tail, is calling his bluff. She's saying, come on then. There she is. Look at the dust. Isn't that wonderful? And now he's moving off. You can just see the moving rustling of the trees there and the dust hanging in the air, the smell of carcass and here come the lions back again. That is just fantastic. I'm just watching the elephant, I think he's moving off. the other one now. Brilliant. All right, Brian, I think we're probably going to have to move out. Guys, the radio comms are such that 
I can't hear what's going on. I don't know if there are other game drives trying to get into this area, so I think let's move out. We've had an absolutely amazing sighting. It's not going to get better than that. And so let's pull out and see what else we can find. Continue our hunt for Sindile, the male leopard. Phew! How's that, Brian? That was fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> that was spectacular. It was absolutely astounding. Watch your heads, everybody. Right, I'll show you where I picked up the mud on my... on my... on my person. We came through. Alrighty then. I don't know what's going on. Where's my phone? It's okay. Everyone's I've got all my kit, I've got my gloves. Try and get back through here. I don't need that anymore. I have to start shedding layers, Brian. Mm. <sighs> That's some very Down we go. Right, hold on everybody. We're going to have to make a little bit of a buzz through here once Brian's fixed the, uh, fixed the aerial straight. You tell me when, Brian. I'm ready. Okay, Yay. hold on tight, everyone. There's a lot of uh, mucky muck going through there. That was actually much easier and windy the other day because the suspension's a bit softer and the tires, I think, are softer. I suppose also, you know, more and more vehicles have gone through there to see the lions, and so it's probably become a little mired and deep. Right, Kirsten, why don't you attempt to speak with me again? I'll let you know if I can hear you. I do copy you, Kirsten, but about two out of five. Anyway, well, the day has brightened up. No, Kirsty, I'm afraid that's a waste of time. I know Gilly in York, or Gilly in York, has had a question. What on earth she's asked, I couldn't begin to tell you, I'm afraid. What we'll do is we'll turn down to the south and then we'll start heading back towards the east, and then we'll get a better idea. Uh, of what's going on. There's a vulture. We had a question about a vulture from an unknown entity somewhere in the universe. And there is a vulture, <coughs> a white-backed vulture. And Brian, the elephant, he's off to the left there. You may just be able to catch him disappearing off through the trees. You might be unsighted, actually. Yeah, I can't. Oh, there he is. There, you got him. Just miles away, you can see him wandering off. That was so spectacular. So spectacular. Anyway, one does get that feeling that all is right with the world, not with the radios, of course, but with the world. So yes, a few vultures, but now, I mean, there are a number of reasons that there are not so many vultures around here. And the reason for that is that the carcass is hidden under the trees. And vultures, unlike the New World vultures, so the vultures of the Americas, in this area they find kills with their eyes. They don't use their noses like many of the storks, which are actually more closely related to New World vultures than our vultures are. Uh, they find carcasses with smell, and especially over those forested areas of the Amazon, for example, you can't see anything. But out here, the vultures find almost exclusively with sight. And so that's why there are more of them there. One or two of them would have seen it as they sort of took off and then they'd have landed again. 
but those soaring vultures wouldn't have seen anything there. Kirst, I'm afraid, waste of time trying to talk to you at the moment. I will try and get into some better signal area as soon as possible. This is the western boundary of Aratuza now. We'll turn south here and then immediately east as soon as we can and we should then get better comms with the final control. Check my phone, see if there's anything, any signal. Oh, we got... Yes, oh, Mike in Dallas, why do lions lick the meat? Malik, sorry about that. Um, <laughs> I'm hoping things will improve from here. Uh, Malik, the so they lick, they lick the fur so that they can expose the skin and get their teeth. In. They they all lick the fur because the fur I believe is a very important form of roughage that they get. They do, you've seen dogs and cats chewing on grass, I'm sure. Lions sometimes do the same thing, and I think hair to a large extent. Totally. I mean, hair is almost devoid of anything that they can digest, but I'm sure it helps the digestive system to move. So that's one of the other reasons that they do a little bit of licking of the fur there. Uh, the other reason is just to clean off. So, I mean, they've got that thick layer of sort of leathery skin that the buffalo have. It's probably about that thick, which is what, Brian, about half a centimeter, so uh, about a fifth of an inch and it's not very nutritious either unless you're a hyena and so they'll lick that to get the meat to get the sinew and to get the last bits of sort of muscle off the skin and that will help them or that will be very tasty to them okay next question here we go uh jillian york when will he get his full mane i think that male is probably about two and a half years old jilly and you know we've been looking uh, we've got some really nice examples now of lion manes <coughs> We had that young man, the youngster there, maybe two and a half to three years old. We had, the, we've seen the Birmingham's lately. They are pushing five and six, you know, but I think they're not all the same age. So let's say five or six. And then we had the Matimbas, 10 up to 11 years old, almost, yeah, between 11 years old and 12 years old. Yesterday, we saw the Matimbas. And they, of course, have got the most full manes. And so the manes continue to, to develop throughout their, their years. They get to about their maximum mass between 8 and 10 years, but the mane continues to develop. And I've seen a 15-year-old lion, astoundingly old for this area and in astoundingly good condition. And he had kind of a middle parting down his, the back of his head because his head got so long, it didn't stand up anymore. So there's no real time that a, a you know a mane will get as full as possible it's a bit like a human beard where it will grow until the days that we pop our clogs as they say so we're just going to see if we can find a few more tracks around here otherwise we'll head back towards the east we are heading east as is obvious by the risen sun into which we are heading thank you brian for that that was very kind of you you, you did that by instinct, didn't you? Well done. Brian just uh, covered my bald spot there. Yeah, Steph apparently is up and running. I don't think he's actually running. That's just, just a figure of speech. Let's go and find out what he's looking for. Absolutely, definitely not running. That is the one thing that we don't try and do here as much as possible. But we took the liberty while we were off air and fixing the little gremlin in the backpack to come and find the drag mark that I told you we were going to come and have a look for this morning, a little bit earlier in the show. Well, we found the drag mark. This is the drag mark. Doesn't look like much except for some ruts that you can see in the sand. And basically what it is, is an impala that Karula killed not last night, the night before, and which was stolen by some ahina and dragged. And these drag marks is what us as field guides love finding. It gives you this little electric thrill in your 
in your body and it's because it generally means that there's a kill around. Now you can see this particular drag mark has been dragged underneath the, the leaves here and how I'm, how I'm seeing that is have a look at how flat these grasses are. Grass is flat and pointing in one direction. And it's come through the trees. Obviously, VM's aerial can't go through the trees, so he's going to walk around the tree. I'm going to walk on the drag mark here. And it was probably dragged all this way by Ahina. Now, why Ahina dragged these kills away from where they were killed is because when something dies, it makes a noise. Not only does it make a noise, but that noise attracts all predators in the area. Hyenas are notoriously... Uh, greedy. They're going to take that kill. They want to get it for themselves. So, so what they do is they pick it up and they drag and run away with it. Now James has quickly got an elephant bull to show you, a huge elephant bull that's going to give us time to decipher this trail for you. So everyone, this is the same elephant bull that we saw earlier and he was the one that chased the elephants, at least the lions. He's the same one that we saw initially earlier today. He's the same one that left his scent all over the place. He's uh, not nasty to cars at all, but he started coming down the road to us, so I just wanted to move out of the way to give him the opportunity to move along the road. But quite interestingly, he then he got a fright from the noise of the car and moved off the, off the road, so I feel a little bit bad that we moved. But I didn't put us in the shade, Brian, didn't I? Yeah, yeah. He's pretty calm and pretty chilled out. He just saw us kind of standing in his path and he started shaking his head a little bit. I'm going to move forward and then turn. Nature's darling, I think you've just asked a question about Asiatic elephants in this area, is that correct, Kirsty? Captured, oh, if captured elephants were released, would they survive? Uh, it depends entirely on their experience. If they'd been captured as youngsters, very small youngsters, I think it's unlikely that they would survive uh, very comfortably. They could survive, but, you know, they could fall prey to predators if they were very young. He's having a bit of a go at this marula tree. This is going to be quite interesting. Oh, I think he might break that bough. Look at the tree shaking there. Um, nature's darling, so, but, you know, so if you released a big bull like this into a different area, if you caught him and then released him, he'd be absolutely fine. And certainly there are many, many experiments, or not experiments, examples of elephants being released into reserves where they have, you know, they've been, well, they're normally taken out of, elef uh, out of places like this and released into other reserves and they're absolutely fine. But any animal that is removed from the wild is almost universally difficult to reintegrate into the wild, especially if they were born in captivity. So the more experience they have, the better. I think in a social species like elephants, which are not particularly nasty to each other, uh, by default, I mean, so I mean, if, if there was, say, you released a, a cow and a youngster, they may well be adopted by a herd who would look after them. Oh, please don't push it over. Please don't push that tree over. I will shout at you. Now, this is one of those questions, everybody, you're going to say to me. If I start shouting at him, you're going to say, but you say you don't interfere, well, which is true, but it's sometimes very difficult not to. And this is a little bit like watching a hyena kind of approach a leopard, knowing that it will do harm if it gets hold of the leopard. The temptation is to warn the leopard. There you go, you can break that little branch off. That's it, that's fine. But leave the tree intact, please. And of course, there's nothing unnatural about what he's doing. Look at him, he's crossed now. He's 
filled with testosterone, his whole body is coursing with testosterone, he needs an outlet for that. And he's taking it out on the tree and scratching his chin at the same time. <laughs> This is so fantastic. He's just feeling frustrated, you know. A must bull elephant is a, just a, well, six tons of frustration. I, just, I find it difficult to explain. I, I think many men will know exactly what I mean when you just, uh, you're a bit angry, you're a bit ornery, and things are just not quite going your way, and the slightest, the slightest thing will set your temper off and that's basically how this elephant feels. He's trying to find a herd where he can kind of, uh, well not to put too fine a point on it, I think mating would definitely help him feel a lot better about things, but that's, it's difficult. Not all the cows are in estrus, they'll only mate when they're in estrus and they have to allow him to mate because of the mechanics of how it happens with elephants he has to really kind of allow it. Now there's a herd of zebra behind him which you can just see there walking through the woodland. Let's see how he reacts to them. I'm still in awe at that incredible sighting we had with the lions of this elephant chasing them off and the light filtering through those trees as the dust began to settle as he moved off was absolutely spectacular. And I hope uh, we managed to get that across to you. So picking something to eat here. And you can see those zebras, while, I mean, they're fast, and there's some impala there as well, somewhere knocking about. They are weary of him. They're much faster than him, but they saw his direction, and they kind of thought, you know, okay, guys, let's not push this. Let's just move out the way a bit. I wonder if they can tell if he's in must or not. I wonder if they associate the smell of his dripping urine with, um, well, heightened sense of irritation, if you like. Many will tell you that it's aggression, that an elephant bull in must is aggressive. I personally detest that term because it implies that he's kind of uh, angry for no reason. He's just more easily irritated. But he has not been in the slightest bit aggressive with us. Brilliant. Okay, let's turn around and continue in the way that we were going. I don't want to continue the way we are going because we will lose communications again. We'll just do a quick about turn. Ah, now, Steph has found something else, something that I see being deposited on a regular basis. We managed to decipher the puzzle of where this impala went, and basically what you're looking at is what's left of this particular impala. This Karula spent a lot of energy killing, and then it was just stolen by those nasty ahinas, and basically this impala was, was peeled. <laughs> I can't think of any other way to describe it. It contains absolutely no bones whatsoever and the meat has completely been licked off. Have a look at that. Now, it's not uncommon for impala to be peeled by a hyena. Their jaws are strong enough to separate the skin from the meat below and that's what's happening. This you're looking at the bottom of the skin. This would have been attached by connective tissue to the muscles and here is the top. This is now the top part. Not quite gonna make a bathroom rug or a throw for my bedroom. It is quite smelly at the moment. Make a nice underpants. VM says it'll make a nice pair of underpants for him. <laughs> Where that like came Tarzan. from? Like, oh, like Tarzan. Yes. <laughs> uh, very funny, but 
There we go, that's the skin. There are some fragments of bone lying around. I've got one or two here that I've seen now, of course, because I want to show you they are not here at all. Ah, oh, there we go. Here's a piece of bone. <coughs> There's bone with the marrow that's been licked out. There's another piece of bone. There's another piece of bone, all from this impala. So what happened was the, the hyena would have peeled the impala and eaten basically everything at leisure, even licking out the marrow. So that's exactly what happened here. So hyena, easy meal. All the hyena had to do was listen. He would have heard or he would have heard the kill or he would have smelt the carcass, run in, stolen the kill from, from Karula, and then dragged it probably about five or six hundred yards to consume it at leisure in this particular place. And I would imagine that this would have happened at night time because it's a fairly open area this. Early in the morning. So early in the morning VM says that's what didn't happen. Unfortunately I wasn't on the property but VM says early in the morning sun would have just been coming up or would have been just pre-dawn nice and open as you can see and that would have allowed this particular hyena to feed in the comfort of knowing that nothing could really sneak up on them. Would have finished it all and then carried on with the day. So that's that. So at least we managed to unravel the unravel the, 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 the puzzle for you. Now you'll notice I'm using a stick to touch this carcass. I don't touch carcasses with my hands. It's a bad practice to get into our chat. We actually don't know why this impala died. We can only guess that it died because Karula was choking the life out of it, but it may have succumbed to some other type of disease. In the dry period like we've got now, anthrax is a real problem out here. And I'm not saying that to scare anybody. We're not in danger of dying over here right away. Anthrax is a very normal part of the ecosystem out here. And in dry periods, animals pick up anthrax in drying up pans. And they, um, they can die. And predators pick it up. They're not as susceptible to it. So that's that. I'm glad we found it. Unraveled that puzzle of a drag mark. And got to show you exactly what happens post-stealing, basically. Now, come on. Let's go and have a look at what's happening in this valley here. The Samsung just asked if we use the sun when we're tracking animals. Um, no, I can't say that I do. What we do definitely use is, um, is use wind. So when you're tracking animals, you do keep wind direction absolutely in, in consideration. And to do that, you use an ash bag. You can use grass or kick dust or pick up some sand. But we use a little ash bag. As you can see, it's a very, very effective way. Even even the lightest of breezes. Oh, my camera is full of ash. Oh, sorry. I've just dusted VM. As you can see, in the, even in the lightest of breezes, the ash falling out of the sock will give you a direction of breeze. Do we, do we take it into 100% consideration when you're tracking something? No. So absolutely when the animal's tracks are very fresh, you will, you will take the wind direction into consideration. But when you're tracking an animal, it doesn't matter where the wind's blowing, the primary focus is actually tracking, but not the sun. Unless, of course, it's getting dark and you need to get back, then we'll use the sun. You don't want to be out here in the bush when the sun is down. So I suppose, actually, I'll rescind what I said and I'll say yes, the sun is, you do take it into consideration. You're not going to track first thing in the morning and you're absolutely not going to track going into the dark. Alright, and now James has an update for you while we carry on looking for something interesting in this valley. Uh, the only update I have at the moment, everyone, is that I'm taking my jacket off because it's a little bit hot. Um, but what I did want to say to you was that I completely misheard the final control when um, we crossed over. Uh, to Steph and I, I believe I linked by saying that Steph's found something. Ooh. I linked by saying that Steph has found something that I see deposited all the time. I don't see impala carcasses deposited all the time. I thought that. Uh, Kirsty had said something about an impala midden, and of course it is my lot in life to watch animals relieving themselves. So that just clears that up for you, because I'm sure you were desperately worried about what I meant. Okay, on we go. <laughs> it has warmed up quite nicely. I will have to, of course, remove my undershirt at some stage, but I won't do that live.
that will be offensive. You'll be able to see hairy belly in human form. Now, no tracks of this young male leopard, so we're going to do a little exploration of the Aratuza International Airport and see if he hasn't popped out here, because this is apparently, this is where the ping came from. There's the giraffe, Brian. It's not, not the best giraffe sighting we've ever had, but it is a sighting. There we go, everybody. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> Fantastic giraffe sighting. Feet. Super zoom his feet, Brian. Super zoom his feet, huh? Whoa! Look at that. Look at that, everyone. Giraffe feet. Giraffe feet sighting. That's the best giraffe foot sighting I've had backlit from this distance ever. The universe hath smiled upon us generously. Okay, I'm afraid that's a really rubbish giraffe sighting, everyone. Let's carry on. Alrighty, we're going to go to the southern end of the airstrip now. Just rot the road carefully for any signs. Of course, Sindile and Shadow used to lurk about in these thickets next to the airstrip quite regularly. Very clever place for a leopard to live because, of course, in the evening, a lot of antelope will come out onto the open area that is the airstrip, and that just gives them some space to see what wants to come and eat them. And in this case, it was Shadow and Sindile. There is there. Very nice sighting there of a. Oh, there are two birds here. But let's look at that one first. That's the crowned lapwing. And the crowned lapwing, of course, a ubiquitous bird of the open areas and open plains, running around trying to catch insects. Oh. That's absolutely unbelievable. Did you see that, Brian? No. The bird just went to the loo. Quite incredible. He's got a lovely call. It's so indicative of wild areas, and you know, they quite often live in uh, sort of city parks. And they're one of those little touches of wilderness that you get in our urban settlements. And the most interesting thing about a crowned lapwing, of course, is that he is totally water independent. And that's probably one of the reasons you see him so often. He's got a special gland just below, or just above his nose, on that red beak, and it's a salt gland. And it allows him to excrete salt far more effectively than just his kidneys can. He's not very good at hitting his mark, is he, Brian? He has to run out of your frame very often. <laughs> now, the other bird that I saw here, Brian, I don't know if you can see him there. There's one just going past that golden piece of fallen leaf, and he's running. Can you see the golden, the little sort of guy, kind of goldy piece of leaf? There he is, well spotted. That is a pippet, everyone. Now, a pippet for the non-birder is likely to anaesthetize you with its complete boringness because it is so boring in color. But to those who are birders, a pippet is a good addition to a list. And I know, Erin, you were sitting on about 71 birds yesterday. Or maybe the African pippet is a, another addition. Not a particularly memorable one, but an addition nevertheless. Oh, Jester, what a very good question. You want to know why it is that birds don't pee? Well, I'm something of an expert of animals excreting in front of me, and so I'll tell you. They do pee, 
but they pee and they poo at the same time. Uh, they don't have a urethra and, um, well, a rectum, not to put too uh, fine a point on it. They don't have them as separate openings. They've only got one opening, it's called a cloaca, and so the urinary tract and the end of the digestive tract end up in the same hole and comes out together. Now, when you look at a, a bird's dung or a reptile's dung, you often find that little white patch with sort of the brownish muck. This is a disgusting discussion, but it must be had. And that white patch is the uric acid crystals that form in urine, and it would form in your own urine eventually, but that's, that's the urine, and it's so liquid because the urine is then mixed in with all of that, and that's why you don't ever see a bird or a reptile having a pee. I don't think fish do either, actually, or amphibians. I think we may, as mammals, might be the only ones who have that sort of double opening. Very nice, Brian. Did you enjoy your pippet sighting? I did. Were you overwhelmed with a sense of joy? I was. Yes. Wonderment. I was in the, in the savagery, awe inspiring savagery. Ooh. Hang on one second, Kirsten. Unless Stefan's got something that's going to run away, let's just have a quick look at this giraffe, which is a much better sighting than the legs we saw earlier. There she is. This is giraffe. Now, I've been doing a little bit of research into skeletons since Brian and I found uh, Nigel the Nyala. If you didn't see Nigel the Nyala, don't worry about it. But basically, he was a Nyala that was killed by a male leopard and stolen by lions. But his spinal column was almost intact. So I did a bit of reading up about the spinal column. And the interesting thing about the spinal column of all mammals, of course, is that the neck vertebra, they're always seven. And in the case of the giraffe, the first two, C1 and C2, that's called cervical one and cervical two, and they're the two first vertebra, one of which articulates with the head, and the other articulates, well, with itself, basically. But in a giraffe, where you, if you lift your head back now, you can basically turn your head back about 90 degrees. You watch that giraffe's head. The giraffe can move its head 180 degrees, and that's because the first joint, the axis joint, or the atlas joint, sorry, I'm getting this mixed up now, axis joint, which is the joint that joins the skull to the, to the neck, is able to bend at 180 degrees. See how he effortlessly kind of extends his head like that. And that's because that joint is so much more flexible than it would be on any other animal just about. And eating Cambritum, of course, which is not a particularly delicious thing to eat, they are full of tannins. Leopold, we haven't heard from you for some time. Um, I hope that you were well. And you asked the interesting question that I don't know I have the answer to. How do round ears compare with pointy ears in functionality? Well, what a very good question. Um, I don't know. I couldn't begin to tell you. Safe to say that animals that use their ears uh, more extensively than others seem to have round ears. So let's look at wild dogs or kudu, for example. They tend to have much more rounded ears, unlike these pointy ones here. And of course, a giraffe does hear very well, but a giraffe's main defensive mechanism is the fact that he's taller than everything else, but like Brian. And so he is able to look, or she is able to look as a defensive strategy rather than have to hear. So maybe that's got something to do with it. Could be. Potentially, maybe, Brian. Mm. So 
you don't see many animals eating these red bush willow trees and that's why I think there's so many of them around. They obviously have a very effective sort of uh, chemical defensive <coughs> methods. Michelle, <coughs> you've noticed the patch on her neck. That patch on her neck is something that happens to all giraffe. It's quite a good way of ageing them, as the worse it is, the older they are. It's something called parafilaria, which is a, a parasite that grows on the skin of giraffe, basically. It's an ectoparasite. It doesn't seem to harm them at all, but the older they get, the more extensive those patches become. That's so called parafilaria. I don't think she's very old. I don't think she's a youngster. Oh, a question from someone called Green Hornet. Hello, Green Hornet. You say, do giraffe break their necks when they fight with each other? Green Hornet? They do not break their necks when they fight with each other. I'm, well, I'm, I've no doubt there's at, at least one or two examples in history of that happening. I've never heard of it happening. Their necks are particularly strong and, I mean, the vertebra are enormous. So they're the same number of cervical vertebrae in that animal as there are in your own neck and indeed in the neck of an uh, elephant shrew. And so they're very large, they're very long, and they're very strongly held together by ligaments. And of course those are then supported by muscles and tendons. And so you'll find that to break a giraffe's neck is quite difficult. And even when they fall over, they seldom break their necks. But they do struggle to get back up again. Brian, I don't know if you, are you at full zoom? Mm -hmm. If you zoom in on the neck there, there's an inchworm. Uh, it's fallen off now. It was hanging from her. She clearly disturbed it from the tree. Oh, it's gone. And Justin, I think your question is, you, you want to know how they're able to eat with their necks fully extended into the ear. Is that correct, Kirsty? Feet. With their feet. Oh, sleep. Oh, there we go. Okay. Right, they're able to sleep with their necks in the air because, much like many animals, uh, they just, you know, they, they can relax in such a way that the joints in the neck, and I don't know the exact mecha the mechanism of this, they don't have to... Basically what happens is when, when you fall asleep, your or your, your nervous system will stop functioning in those muscles that aren't sort of automatically operated. And in an animal like this, uh, or a horse which sleeps standing up, many animals which sleep standing up, those muscles which in you are switched off when you lie down, when you pass out, are not switched off. The neurological pathways that make the muscles fire in an animal like this allow it to rest with its head held up. And I think you'll also find that the held at a certain angle, the held at a certain angle, the, the vertebra of the neck probably rest with very little muscle power having to hold them up. The giraffe keeps looking behind us and I keep hoping that there's going to be sight of a leopard with a collar around his neck, but I don't see anything. Right, Stefan Winterboer, I'm talking to the giraffe now, has got something very interesting to tell everybody, so let's go across to him. He wants to show you a stick insect. Well, it's only when you come down to this particular level that you realise exactly what it is that's going on down here. We just want to show you, have a look at what's in this grass that we've found. We took a little experiment and literally sat down where we were and in this grass clump was this fantastic creature. He looks exactly like the clump of grass he's sitting on. Can you all see it? It's a grasshopper. And here is the tip of his head. There. 
with some antennae that look like grass stalks. There's his eye. This particular species have got a very elongated head. There's the mouth there. Here's one back leg. This is a joint. Here's the one that's the thigh. That's the knee. And then hidden in the grass all the way to here is the abdomen. But have a look at how closely matched even the shades of pink on the head are to these shades of pink in this particular grass. Have a look at this grass, the edge there. is the same shade of pink as you're now finding on this particular grasshopper, these browns and yellows and what's left of the green at least anyway. Isn't that incredible? These long elongated compound eyes and then these mouth parts. Now I've been thinking why would the grasshopper have such elongated an elongated head and the, the obvious question is, or the obvious answer is of course to make him look as much like a grass stalk as possible allowing his mouth to carry on eating while the top of his body stays still. So his mouth can be furiously busy feeding on grass right there with the top of his body looking dead still. It's just one of these, another one of these brilliant sort of evolutionary adaptations to staying hidden. Once again, predators of insects like this react to movement and as long as he's keeping still, he won't be seen and then he won't be preyed upon. But he might as well have his mouth on the bottom of his body that can be eating grass while the top of him stays hidden. Amazing, hey? Another thing that I found while it's been sitting right underneath my nose here is the fact that, have a look at this leaf. This leaf has been almost entirely mined by some insect. You can see that all the cellulose between the leaves' veins has been eaten. And all that they've left is the hard veins where all the leaves' fluids used to run. Now, of course, leaves are where photosynthesis happens. And photosynthesis is the way that the plant feeds itself. Photosynthesis turns sunlight into energy or sugars using chlorophyll and it then uses the leaf, which has these things called stomata on them, to suck water up from the roots. So the leaves do two things. One is that they house the cell structure that houses chlorophyll and turns sunlight into water. The next is they have these little structures on them called stomata, which basically bleed water. Water is very sticky at a chemical level. Sun evaporates the water, the next drop comes into the stomata, and so the tree at the same time, this leaf, at the same time, pushes sugars down the, the tree. It is also sucking water and minerals up and feeding itself. But because of that, there's quite a lot of things going on in a plant cell. And because of that, they are very valuable from a, from a, from a nutrition point of view. And you can see that some brilliant insect has mined every last cell inside this leaf and just left the veins, the venation, the... the the, the network of arteries and, or basically arterioles if it were a human or, or an animal. Have a look how fine that is. Can you see that over here? Mm -hmm. I don't know how tight you can get. Yeah. Isn't that amazing? Left that road map for us to see. It gives you a new idea of what's going on in these leaves. I'll put a whole leaf next to it so that you can see what one looked like. That is what one looked like before it was mined. Crazy, eh? All that's going on in that leaf. I think it's just brilliant. <laughs> All right, we're going to leave this grass, this terrified grasshopper, to his day in his grass pile, and we're going to go sit down next to another grass pile and see what we can go and pick out for you. What a brilliant exercise. Very interesting. Ah. Siberia has just asked a nice question, would that grasshopper change color like a chameleon? No, I don't think so, Siberia. I haven't, seen, I haven't seen grasshoppers change color. I think that those grasshoppers, in their adult form like that was, is actually, they are actually born that way. They're born to walk from grass clump to grass clump, staying as hidden as what they can. That's what I think, at least anyway.
All right. Now that I've stuck my head up a bit, it's always a good thing to scan the bush in front of you. Yeah. Jessica just asked me if it's true, if, if I had to stand on a, on a cockroach that they immediately lay their eggs. I'm going to have to say that that's true. And the only way that I know that is because of the inquisitive nature of my mind. I heard exactly the same rumor when I was a little boy. And I just couldn't help but stand on a cockroach to see if an egg casing came out. Not in every instance, but definitely on a few, an egg case or something white, an encapsulated white capsule was ejected from the back of the cockroach. Um, and it could very well be that it's an egg case. Whether or not that was as a result of 40 at that time, probably 40 or 50 pounds of human jumping on it, I'm not too sure. Um, I don't think that they are, that those, that those egg cases will in actual fact hatch. But, um, but yeah, um, good question, yes, is the answer to your question. Whether or not those eggs are fertile, or whether or not those eggs will, will actually hatch into new cockroaches, I can't really say. I, do, I don't think so. I doubt it. Insects need to be quite particular about where they lay their eggs and where they, what time they lay their eggs and where they lay their eggs on. It seems like this particular patch, although quite empty, has a lot of animal movement on. We've got a lot of different dungs here from different animals. We've got impala and elephant, lots of elephant. In actual fact, I think on more than one occasion we've actually seen elephant feeding in this area. We've got even, it looks like hippo. Yeah, it is hippo. <clears throat> this is a hippopotamus. You can see relatively fresh hippopotamus. I would say probably not from last night, from the night before last. And I know that it's hippo because it's sprayed up on the bushes here. Have a look at the way that it's sprayed up here. Caught even in these areas here. In an area you wouldn't normally associate there to be hippo. This is a hippopotamus, quite strong smelling. Must be honest, now that I've got my face quite close to it. And you can see that they've sprayed it up to about, I'm kneeling down now, you can see that they've sprayed it up to about my head level, which would be at about the level of the tail. They would have walked and wagged their paddle-like tail quite vigorously as they were defecating, and that would then spray the bush and the surrounding bush with dung as he carried on feeding. Not much, unfortunately, for hippo. As you can see, the grass is looking pretty denuded here. Alrighty, we've got some elephant dung here. But the fact that uh, we've only got dung here and not much else would lead me to send you over to James for an update on what he's got rather than look at any more of this with us. So we made it to the bottom of the airstrip and we turned around and we're now going north again. And we're just still trying to find tracks of our old pals and dealer. Many, uh, many elephant tracks around here. And we did see a baby giraffe while you were gone, but he went off absconding into the bushes to get away from us. And then Brian said, oh, what's that? And I stopped and I saw exactly what he was looking at and it looked like a leopard posing mid-stride. And it was a log. I was highly disappointed. Yes, Brian was very cross. But you didn't say a bad word, did you, Brian? No. no. Well done. Morning, Gloria. I have to agree with you completely. You say it's been such an excellent week for big cats. It's been an astonishingly good week for big cats. Really, really special. And, uh, I mean, long may that luck last. We know it won't, uh, but we hope that it will. It, We'll ride it for as long as it does, and you say even seeing some dealer tracks would be fantastic. Yeah, I agree. Haven't seen them yet, though. Anyway, we're going to make our way but sort of slowly back towards the east, towards Juma. Back along the routes that we used to know that he would hang out on, 
maybe his mum has popped out of Hoffman's, maybe she's finished eating her impala that she was eating there the other day with Tingana, Warthog, sorry. Very. Leopold, nice one about um, impala and their eating or drinking, not impala, predators, and their eating or drinking of their prey's blood. You know, most of the most of the predators out here are independent of water, and that's because of the amount of water that there is in any kind of uh, flesh. And so, while lions and leopards will readily drink if they can. They don't have to all the time, and that's because they have so much of the, the water that they get from their prey, and a large amount of that water will be held in the blood. So yes, they will absolutely drink it. Sounds a little grim, doesn't it, Brian? Vampirous. Macabre. This is where they used to lurk. Delia in those halcyon days of his childhood when he and his mummy would wander about here eating impala, sometimes dica, sometimes steenbok for a bit of variety in these thickets. And Wendy in Nebraska, of course, this is what I've been hoping fervently for, but whether indeed it will happen, I cannot tell you. Wendy, you say you're sure that he will recognize me because when his mother left him for, I think it was two weeks at one stage, um, he spent time, or I spent time with him. Well, I think we all did. And uh, my, my fervent, completely anthropomorphic hope is that he will recognize me fondly. Wait there, everyone. Don't move, Brian. I don't know what I thought I saw. Well, I do. I thought I saw a leopard track. There's nothing remotely resembling a leopard track on the road here. So I don't know. It's all just the, it's all psychological. I've been talking about it so much. So in all seriousness, I, I don't know if these leopards would recognize us. Um, it's, it's really difficult to say. We'd like to think that they would, but I don't know. You know, we recognize each other as human beings because I'm going to come back to the sighting, uh, to my conversation. Steph has found something that may survive the apocalypse. I'm just going to open on it. Now, we've managed to find, and it is quite fortuitous this, but we've managed to find a cockroach for you to have a look at. And this is specifically to Jessica, who wanted to know if you stand on a cockroach, does the egg come out? She's heard of it. And to which I replied, I have actually stood on cockroaches and they have laid an egg. We're not going to stand on this one, though, to see if an egg comes out. But what you are focused on there is where the egg would come out. That is the back end of the cockroach there. And they are some of the most remarkable insects on the face of the planet. They can apparently withstand quite high levels of radiation. They can eat almost anything. They're detritivores, so they of course live very close to humans. Being detritivores, meaning they eat detritus, they live on almost anything. Now this one we found underneath a stump for you. And have a look at those nice tiger stripes almost on its back. Those very spiked hind legs which it will use for climbing and for jumping. And it is nocturnal and they will scurry about in the undergrowth eating basically dead things 
and dead vegetation, not dead animals, dead vegetation and fungus and trying not to get eaten. Soft bodied, isn't that just amazing? And quite lucky for us to find it, I must be honest with you Jessica, it was a, it was a lucky find. You don't find cockroaches that often out here. The amount of scorpion out here and the amount of solifuge absolutely stops them from being used. So are we going to give him a house again? I'm going to put a stump back onto him, little branch, keep him hidden. And that way any prying eyes she can carry on with her nap and come out again tonight. Now this is a big peltiforum and just to finish off our grasshopper thing from just now, we've got another grasshopper here. This one now obviously keyed specifically to, to green grass and specifically to peltiforums. Right there, Viam, at the end of my finger is a grasshopper that is not looking like a grass but looks every bit like the leaves on this peltiforum. Now Siberia Zumi is wanting to know if they change colours and Siberia, no they don't change colours but you can have a look, we're just battling to find him. I'm going to put my finger there again for VM, right at the end of my finger. You see him? And now his abdomen is exactly like these compound leaves. I'm going to just get a piece of grass so that I can use it as a pointer for you. <clears throat> and then we'll try again. It was a little bit difficult for you to see that one. But now, of course, I've now got to try and find it. Oh, there we go. Right there. There's his head. And there's his abdomen, the end of it. With He's only a one-legged grasshopper. A uni leg of sorts. His other one has been lost in a fight or got stuck in a branch and he's shed it. So there's his head. And what's amazing is that those stripes on his abdomen are almost identical to the stripes that you'll find on these leaves. I don't know. S a surprise around every bush that we turn over here. I mean, it's actually quite incredible. When you think about the fact that there's not much here. I mean, it's dry and it's dead and it doesn't look like anything, but the second you go down to the eye level, you start picking out all these wondrous things. Now, we're coming to the end of this drainage line here, which I want to try and show you. I think we've got a place where some buffalo have spent the night. We've got some buffalo close by. You can see here, have a look. This is the urine mark of the buffalo. He's had a wee here. And it's still wet. And you can see that the tracks, here's where he stood. This is the back of his track. And then he moved over a little bit. And he delivered some of his dung here. But you can see that this is not the freshest of dungs. It's got a little bit of a, a skin on the top. And that shows that it is already chilled. So I would say it's probably from early last night. Not Definitely not from right now. Although, what you don't want to do is take that for granted that there's no buffalo here. It's fairly fresh. Fairly fresh. Buffalo tend to spend the evenings lying up in areas like this where they can reverse their bums into a bush. So if the buffalo was attacked by a lion, he'd reverse his bum into this bush and then he'd be able to protect himself with his horns, rushing out at lion, hooking the lions with, the, with, his, with, his, with, his, uh, with his horns, and staying, keeping his hind quarters into this bush right here. And this is how he would have protected himself, keeping front forward of the horns, and then reversed into these bushes, and charging out and charging back again. That's what he would have done. That's why he chose this place to sleep in. Lovely picture it in my mind with all the tracks around here. Alright, I've got very, very sketchy 
uh, radio communications in this particular area. So you might go from myself to James while we're busy walking around here. Yeah, I'm just preempting it at the moment. We're going to cross through and hopefully we'll get some better radio signal. And while we're doing it, they might send you through to James. Otherwise, I'll keep on talking until I hear elsewise and we can carry on down here and see what exciting things we can find for you inside this drainage line. Well, everybody, this birthday had its, at least this elephant had four birthdays during the course of that link. It is a floppy-eared youngster that does not look to me to be in great condition. The floppy ear, I think, is a result of cartilage damage to the ear, which could be either genetic or just part of its, uh, or may have damaged it while living. And I say not in great condition, because if you look at him, or her, I think it's a him, just the spinal column is sticking out, the shoulders are sticking out, you can see the scapula there sticking out. And I think that's just an indication that it's not in such great nutritional state. So maybe there's some form of sickness or disease. But it's difficult to say, very relaxed he is. Now, floppy ear, of course, shouldn't affect his life. He should be absolutely fine with an ear like that. But uh, I think many of the elephants are going to struggle going forward with the environmental conditions of dryness that are sure to persist for the next little while. Anyway, he's been very confiding with us. There's the radio dropping on the floor, don't worry. And he did turn towards us at one stage and looked like he was a little bit cross, but he's now absolutely fine. Jilly in New York, that's a very nice, it's not New York, in York, the old version, there in North Country of England. You want to know if there's any kind of effect or any plant out here that has the effect of catnip on animals. So we know that catnip makes cats go crazy. I haven't seen a plant that makes animals do that. Elephants, of course, favor various things like marula fruits. They go ballistic for them. But that's something they can eat, you know. It's not something that just sort of makes them go crazy. So, I'm going to say no, Jilly, but I don't know for sure. This particular plant that's being eaten is the variable bush willow, and they like to eat variable bush willows, do these elephants, much more so than the tree that the giraffe was eating, which is the red bush willow. I think that's quite interesting. Don't you, Brian? Mm -hmm. now coming out to see us. That's marvellous. As he's being so confiding. That's it. Come and say hi. Very nice. <laughs> That's the thumb. Suited up for the morning. Just enjoying the elephant sighting as well. <laughs> <laughs> Very nice. Brian, who's his suit designer? Um, Armani. Armani. Mm. Wow. No, he doesn't mess around, does he? He does not mess around that thumb. He really is. He's in there with the best. Hello, Jester. Two aspects to your question are interesting. The first, surrounding whether or not an elephant pride, I think you used the term. So that's the first aspect of your question. Remember, pride is actually an, a term only used to describe lions. So with an elephant, we'd say herd. So, but very nice from you about whether or not has there ever been an instance where an elephant herd might adopt a lonely other animal, say perhaps a, a buffalo, 
And no, I don't think they would adopt another animal. Would they adopt foreign elephants from different herds? Yes, absolutely they would. Would they tolerate the presence of other herbivores within their herd? And interestingly, I don't think they do. You know, they're, 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 t they're pretty tightly knit, they're pretty egalitarian about each other. But unlike many of the herbivores, which will completely tolerate the presence of each other, these, these ones don't seem to. And I find that quite interesting. So, for example, you might find a herd of elephant, a herd of impala, completely tolerated by or tolerant of a bull wildebeest who's on his own. And that, I mean, is because it's beneficial to both of them because they both provide a little bit of security. This is wonderful. Absolutely wonderful. Hello, fellow. Don't go anywhere. We're really enjoying having a sighting of you. And Catherine, you want to know, if, is there a plant that this elephant could eat that could get him into better shape? Uh, I'm sure there is, Catherine. I don't know what it is. I couldn't tell you what plant would necessarily help him at this stage of his life. Uh, it really is difficult to say, but there will almost there will almost certainly be because I don't know what's wrong with him. But there will be different kinds of plants that help elephants, and there's quite a lot of uh, evidence to suggest that elephants do self-medicate, that they have some kind of knowledge of what chemicals and what plants might actually help them when they are feeling a little bit distressed. You can see quite nicely now from the top of his top of his um, shoulders there, Brian, if you don't mind. The top of his shoulders are sticking out, and that's normally indicative that the health is not quite what it might be. I don't think he's about to drop dead by any stretch, but he certainly could be a little healthier. And with any luck, that will change. Maybe he's just been a bit sick, you know. Now, of course, Joey in Australia, a very good question from you. How much do these behemoth animals eat in one day? Joey, it depends on, obviously, how old the elephant is. But an elephant like this is roughly the same size as a 10-year-old cow. And that the major research for many years, the quote was 150 kilograms a day for a 10-year-old cow. So I would say this elephant probably eats about 150 kilos a day, probably about a three-ton animal and that will be much higher as the animal gets older. So a big elephant bull will eat up to 300 kilograms or 660 pounds of food in one day. Now that's a massive, massive amount. And you can imagine, if you've got an area of, say, 15,000 elephants, you can imagine the effect that they must have on an environment and what would happen were you to remove that population. So, I mean, that's why we call elephants a keystone species. Because they eat such a huge amount. And if you were to, if you were to remove that, or remove their effect from an environment like this, well, you would have an absolutely astonishing kind of change to the vegetation. Let me sneak forward a little bit more, and then I think we'll probably leave off. Oh, shame. He got a little bit of a fright there. Simply because he was a bit cornered, you see. He was a bit cornered by that bush, and he wanted to make sure he could get out. I'm actually just going to wait here, everyone. I don't, he's, I've given him a bit of a fright, and I feel a bit bad about it. Let's just let him calm down. I think with animals like this, you know, they hear in, at very low frequencies, much lower than the frequencies we hear at. And so I'm pretty sure that an engine like this puts out frequencies that are, well, not harmful to the ears, but certainly probably affect the ears a bit more than we think they do.
Samsung, you want to know if an elephant drops dead of natural causes, who will eat him? Well, everyone will eat him. The hyenas, the leopards, you might even, well, not likely leopards, uh, but certainly lions and hyenas would devour him. Vultures will come and eat him. And you may even find a leopard eating on a carcass like this. So all of the major predators, except perhaps wild dogs and cheetah, which don't scavenge, well, they would come and have a go here. Even the little jackals, which we've been seeing quite a lot of recently. Okay, let's just go. I'm going to drive straight past him. I'm not going to stop next to him because I think it will make him a little nervous. He'll probably flick around to face us as we go past. No, he showed us his bottom. Right, let's not make him any more nervous. There's another young bull with him. There he is. I'm going to stop with him. He's exactly the same age. Doesn't have a floppy ear. Also not necessarily in the best possible condition. Hips starting to show a bit. It's a little worrying that it's this time of the year and they're already starting to look a little bit rough. OK, let's go back across to Steph. I hope that he doesn't have another cockroach to show you. I feel he shouldn't be showing you things like that. They're rather disgusting. I'm sure he's got something else interesting, though. Well, we spied this bare branch from quite a distance away. It was very conspicuous in the fact that this particular tree just had a branch that was had no bark on it. When we got a bit closer, we realized that this bark was eaten off by something other than an animal. And the way I knew that was because none of these smaller sticks are broken at all. As you can see, it's been picked relatively clean and in this funny fashion. And it's just the bark, not the wood. Just the bark. And then we found the culprit on another branch of the same tree. Have a look at the way that these termites, these are a different species of termite, has now come onto this dead branch of this white berry bush and has built a daytime shelter. And when I picked away some of the casing, you can see that the termites are working in those tunnels and busy eating away the bark of the tree. And the, the reason why they're building these particular tunnels is because these termites don't have cellular, uh, don't have melanin in their bodies. They pale termites, similar to the termites that eat your homes. And they obviously don't have any protection against UV without any melanin in their systems. And so we found the culprit that is busy peeling this particular white berry bush of all its bark its cambium layer is that these termites, these microtermies as they call them, not macrotermies because they don't build massive termite colonies above the ground and that is because they take this particular cellulose and instead of growing fungus gardens they eat the cellulose there are microbes in their tummy that break down the cellulose and they get all their nutrients from the plant cell. What they do then is they defecate out a pellet and then they have to re-eat that pellet again. It's called coprophagy. Rodents do the same thing. And in that way, they get all the nutrients, all the sugars that are released by the first digestion, they get it in the second digestion. I know it's quite disgusting, but that's exactly what's happening out here. Coprophagy, microtermies, and then these wonderful homes to protect Insects that don't have any melanin in their systems or in their bodies from the harmful rays of the sun. If that's not an advert for sun cream, I don't know what is. All right, now to come on to the differences between the microtermies, which don't grow any termites, and the oh, termite mounds, and the macrotermies, which do grow termite mounds. Siberia Zumi has asked me a question Can you use these particular termite mounds as an oven? I think. I've got very, very poor comms at the moment in my ear, so excuse me if I get your question wrong, but I'm going to answer what I think it is, and it's quite a nice question. Can you use these termite mounds as an oven? Absolutely, you can use these termite mounds as an oven. The majority of what's inside these termite mounds is chewed up cellulose, saliva and clay. It's also baked quite hard and if you dig 
a hole in there. You can build quite a nice pizza oven inside the middle of these, absolutely. And in places like Zambia, I've actually seen termite mounds that are mined. They mine the termite mound, they make bricks, and then they put the baked bricks, or they put the bricks that they've made from the termite mound back into the termite mound itself. And they use the termite mound as a kiln. And then they bake their bricks hard inside these kilns. So absolutely, Zaberia Zumi, if that's what you ask me, can they be used as an oven? Yes. Not only to make food, but also to make building materials. Wonderful structures, these guys. Right. Now, I've got very, very poor communications with Final Control, so we're going to walk off. You may cross over to James, and then... I'm sure I'll hear whether you're with me or not as we go along. Let's see what's underneath here. These stumps are always providing us with the most amazing insects. And even, I think it was last week on Friday, a snake, a little centipede eater. Nothing underneath this one today, though. Not that I can see, at least, anyway. All right, let's carry on. If you excuse me, just trying to contact FC while we're doing that. I just need to find out if we're not speaking into blue space. Uh, FC, Steph, are we still live? So I'll copy. Right here, we've come back on to Vuyatela, on to Juma, everybody. No tracks of Sandila, don't know where he is. Now, Jamie, of course, yesterday afternoon was trolling about for those, and I don't mean that in a negative way. These days you can't say trolling. I mean trawling, that's what she was doing. She wasn't trolling. She was trawling about trying to find those lions when she when she heard an alarm call. Here be the tracks of a young male leopard. Unless they're a female leopard, and I'm just hoping fervently. They're not that fresh. Can you see them there, Brian? These are not old. No, it's a female. I think. Let me just move so that Brian can show them to you. See now, this is where the human psyche really is a problem because I so desperately want to see a young male leopard. This is big for a female. So if you follow me here, can you see down here, Brian? Oh, my shadow's in the way. There's the front foot, there's the back foot. These are not old, these are from last night. My brain is saying to me that that's a female, um, but they're quite big for a female. In fact, they're very big for a female. And Shadow is not big, and Karula is not big either. <laughs> in the wrong place now, though. unless he came around last night. Let's drive up here where maybe we'll be lucky. I don't want to say anything. Anyway, Jamie heard Kudu alarm calling while she was trawling about for the lions yesterday, and that's exactly round about where um, <laughs> where the ping from the collar came from. Uh, I've now I've been totally distracted by those things. Drive slowly in here. Could be lurking under a bush anywhere. This is his old hunting ground, everyone. Oh, the joy it would be.
Now, they're not on the road. Walk straight across that road, obviously on some kind of a mission. They'll be in there. <laughs> Let's just keep up the road, yeah? It doesn't look like anyone's driven this road today. We didn't, certainly. <laughs> Hello, Green Hornet again. Nice name that you have. Big tracks of an elephant bull going up this road. Uh, you want to know about the Zika virus and whether we have it here and do we worry about it affecting the animals? Um, no, I've certainly not heard of any outbreaks here and I don't think it's a factor here for some reason. Why that's the case, I don't know. Brian, do you know anything about it? Um, it's mainly in Brazil, that's where it's... That's right, yeah. yeah. But I don't think it's crossed over here. Yeah. I'm not sure why it wouldn't have though. So, no, I'm afraid I can't tell you much about it or its effect on animals here, but certainly there have been no warnings issued uh, and no one seems to be particularly worried about it. And I don't think it's, uh, that's just sort of lethargy on the part of our public health department, with his, which is uh, notoriously lethargic, but no NGOs have given us any warnings or anything like that either. going to drive very slowly up this road. Just quickly, there was something I was saying there about, you know, whether, whether he would recognize us or not. Facial recognition, I think, is an almost uniquely primate trait. We have very different looking faces and we assess each other's faces. That's why when you meet somebody, you look at their face and you assess every little, and you do it most of the subconsciously, but every little twitch in the face, every little muscle turn of the mouth down, you check to see whether someone's smiling with their eyes, you check to see if their nostrils flare, um, you check to see if they clench their jaws or not. And that kind of facial recognition that we as human beings have, uh, combined with our less or our decreased reliance on smell for recognition and for telling of the state of another human being, I think makes us particularly good at recognizing something on sight. Whereas I think a lot of animals use so many other cues. I don't believe impala recognize each other necessarily by the face. I mean, they look almost completely identical to me. So would he recognize me versus Brian? Uh, I don't, th I'm not sure that he would, even though Brian and I look nothing alike, especially when we stand next to each other. Would he know the difference between male and female? Yes, I suspect he probably would. Animals seem to be very good at being able to tell the difference between male and female human beings. And certainly primates can. I mean, it's hilarious to watch, well, if you're not involved. But monkeys, for example, when they come into camp, uh, not our camp, but into the tourist camps, because no matter how many times you tell people not to feed the monkeys, they're unable to stop themselves. So they feed monkeys and monkeys lose their natural fear of human beings. And then they become a menace. And they don't chase men, but they chase women. And they don't, I remember I worked with a very substantial woman once at a, at a camp north of here. Uh, by substantial, I mean she was sort of six foot two and she was not a, she wasn't lean, shall we say. And so she was weighed a lot more than me and yet the monkeys would chase her and they wouldn't come anywhere near me. So it wasn't just a size thing at all. It was a fact that they recognized her as a female. So they're very, very, very sexist are the monkeys. Now Steph has found a little home to show you. Linking. Have a look at this absolutely fascinating, fascinating, but completely tragic story that we're showing you right now. We've got what's quite obviously a blue waxbill's nest that you're busy having a look at. That collection of grass with those little balls on are a blue waxbill's nest. And they would have fledged some chicks a little bit earlier in the year and the chicks would have tried to get out of the nest. But before, 
The blue waxbill's parents would have built their nest in this buffalo thorn because of the protection that the thorns give to it. But what you need to see is what we're showing next. Is that, is that, there is the leftovers from a chick that got stuck on one of the thorns that was meant to protect it. And obviously couldn't gain purchase with its wings or its feet to get its head off of the thorns and perished there. And then ants came and ate all the flesh away. And what you're looking at there is the skeleton of one of the blue waxbill's chicks that had fallen out of the nest, got stuck on a thorn and died there. I mean, isn't that a story to tell? Tragic, absolutely, but fascinating nonetheless that you can see this little story. Blue waxbill's nest and then this carcass that you can see there, all inside of this buffalo thorn. Wow. Really, really incredible, hey? That something like this just happens. Let's see if we can show you the nest again from a different angle. That's the nest there. It's a collection of grass. And what's quite common in this area is the blue waxbills are building these nests in these buffalo thorns. Other in, and, and, and in other areas, blue waxbills build this nest and then you find wasps that come and build their nests at the entrance to the blue waxbills nest. Which one comes first, I haven't really seen yet. I don't know if the blue waxbills go and look for the wasp nest and then build their nest there, or whether or not the wasps look for the nests and then build their, their nests next to the blue waxbills nest. I don't quite know which one comes first. I would imagine that the birds being the more intelligent, well, in, in, in how I judge intelligence anyway, being the more intelligent of the two organisms would first look for the wasp nest and then come and build their nest there. But in this particular case, the blue waxbills are using the thorns and the thorn barrier that a, that a buffalo thorn gives them as a hiding place, which was also unfortunately the demise of one of their chicks. Unfortunate, but isn't that incredible? All right, let's carry on going. You might cross over to James. I have zero communications with Final Control, and so I don't know whether you're with me or whether you're not with me still, but You'll probably be going to James and we'll find something else exciting for you and show you when we get there. Looks like there is an alien in my skin. Oh, sorry everybody, I was just trying out a new accent there with Brian. He was having a bit of a giggle. Anyway, <laughs> I'm going to be in a lot of trouble when I get home for doing that, of course. It's all right, I'll cope with it. I'll cope with it. Uh, no further tracks of young male leopard, unfortunately. But we're heading towards the end of the drive. I'm going to come back into this area this afternoon and we'll see if I can't be lucky and find whatever what it was that was making those tracks. Otherwise, there was some very large, ooh, no, hyenas, very large elephant bull tracks heading this way. So what we'll do is head on to quarantine and see if there's anything going on over there. Very nice that Steph found that, uh, oh, hello, which is quite useful to know, of course, if we're going for a run later. Buffalo bull with little friend. She his friend there, Brian? Yes. It's a special friend, Mr. Redpilled Oxpecker. That's so nice to see. They're just so relaxed at this time of the day. The birds have settled in. There's the odd chirrup coming from a bush or two. But otherwise there's silence and there's just the odd little bit of ruffling in the leaves as a gentle breeze blows through them. And I've said to you many times before, if you ever want to feel wilderness healing or a sense of true relaxation this time of the day, especially in the middle of winter, when you'll feel precisely as relaxed as this buffalo bull does. He's done his feeding for the day, 
there's just enough heat in the sun and he's going to lie there and he will feel a complete and utter sense of contentment but for the flies that are bothering him slightly. But if you ever really truly want to unwind, this is exactly the atmosphere that you want to do it in. I'll just tell you the very subtle things that I can hear now. I mentioned the leaves slightly rustling, the odd one dropping to the floor. The tap tap tapping of probably a cardinal woodpecker looking for a late lunch. Yes, there'll be the old buzzing of a fly. And then the distance always, I think.